Hello, welcome. I'm Kerry Neederhoody. I'm the author of Thin Places, just out with Canongate. And I'm going to be interviewing Mankon McGann. Hello, Mankon. How are you, Kerry? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself, Mankon. So I am then Mankon McGann, the author of 32 Words for Fields. Um, I had previous books, sort of my illegitimate offspring, my sort of Irish language <laughs> books that never get mentioned in my bio or anything. Lovely little books. And I had some travel books. But this is uh, the first book I've had in a decade, 32 Words for Fields. This is your, your big book. Um, I've just shown people this, a very beautiful book, 32 Words for Fields. It's like with Gill books at the moment. Um, lots of places that you can buy it from. Um, lots of signed places, the Fumbly in Dublin, amongst other places. I'm pretty sure you'll be able to get it at gutter bookshops as well. Um, we're in conversation, I'm interviewing you, Mancon, um, for the Limerick Literary Festival in honour of Kate O'Brien. So firstly, thank you very much to the festival for having us. So I'm just going to run through a couple of questions um, for you, Mancon, but, you know, as anything, it'll probably just go its own way <laughs> because that's what happens with writers. So firstly, congratulations on your incredible book, which I absolutely adore. I've, I think I've read it about three times now and every single time something new comes along. Yeah. And so I first discovered your work um, through a piece that you wrote for the Irish Times about the importance in general, the importance of teaching Irish in a different way to children and how that we would actually gain so much from change in how we spoke about the Irish language. So I was wondering if maybe we could start there and if you could talk a little bit about how you feel we could change our views on the Irish language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that first encounter, as you said with me, must have been this article I wrote in the Irish Times a few years ago, and I felt it was very brave. Like I, I've been writing for the Irish Times for maybe about 10 or 15 years. Mm. And I've written articles about, particularly around St. Patrick's Day, about Irish culture, Irish place names, Irish language. But about two years ago, I wrote this article and I knew I was going out on the limb. And I knew that I might get pushed back to it. Because I dared say something that had been in my mind for a long time. And that is, like, I've spent a lot of my time traveling the road with the world like I was this lost kid looking for meaning and I'd look to find minority cultures in different parts of the world yeah. that were still in touch with their own culture their own community and see was there wisdom in that for me and so you know I'd go off to, to Greenland I'd go off to, to little tri tribes in Africa or in Asia or South America and eventually I thought first I found as most people do there is this unified um, strand running through them all and that is that these people are still connected to nature still connected to yeah. the seasons still connected to the land which produces their food and still connected to some sort of familial connection some sort of rootedness and ancestral connection not only in their own community that both though goes right right back and the thing that dawned on me after whatever about 10 or 15 years of traveling I came back to Ireland I bought a little bit of land in Westmeath about 20 years ago and I realized, my God, we have the same thing here. We have been living on this island, growing our own food, worshipping the leaves, the plants, the insects, the, the rainbows, the cloud formations, the waves of this land for eons, you know, until the fifth century when we put a slight Christian gossamer thin. <laughs> But, but we kept that old, that belief system alive, definitely underneath it. So we have always done this. And one of the key places that you still see that one can see it a little bit in in the presence of ring forts the fact that we haven't destroyed all the old fields and the ring forts and and our old our old sort of um sacred and ritual sites on top of hills the cairns and the graveyards but particularly you can see it in the language and i thought why does nobody ever say this why when we speak about the irish language do we talk about oh, how it was beaten into me or how it was such a difficult language or how the politicians you ruin it and it's all the fault of the government or of the education system that I don't speak the language. So I had all of those in my mind and I had a separate thing in my mind. So as I said, I used to make travel programs from about 1996 until 2007. And in 2007, I made a series called No Berla, which I it was a, t a series for TG Carr in which I went around Ireland trying to just speak the Irish language. And it was a revelation to me. It was just came out after the, the, there was a national census that said a quarter of the population spoke Irish. Yeah. So I then decided, OK, that means one in every four people I meet will be able to speak Irish. And I went out with, uh, with hidden cameras 
and I had a, a very sort of complicated and convoluted and difficult journey. But to, 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 to sort of to, to be concise, I found that a quarter of the population didn't have Irish. <laughs> so what was most intriguing was when I brought all that footage or when my, the production crew back into the lab, uh, back into the, the edit suite, we were looking at these people filmed with hidden cameras in the, in the big screens in the edit suite. And we could see in their eyes this complicated range of feelings mm. of envy, of, of, of yearning, of yeah. anger, of frustration when I was speaking Irish to them. And I realized and of love too, of, yeah. of jealousy, of envy, of connection. Yeah. We have such a complex connection with this language of ours, as we should. You know, it's been the language that has been spoken on this island for thousands of years. And uh, so I thought, we should be talking about that. We should be talking about the emotional, the psychological element of the Irish language. And if we then thought about that as a way of teaching it, um, we'd go about it in a very different way, rather than teaching it as another you know, language like French or, or, um, or ancient Greek or Latin. Um, and so that was the idea. That was the idea behind that article. I said, I'm going to dare write my first article to talk about the language from a sort of not a bitter way, not a colonial beaten in way, but just a romantic what if way. What if we, we opened up our hearts and dreamt bigger and had a bigger spiritual connection? So to answer your question, <laughs> that would be how I'd like to, how I would like, how I'd love to have a thought in school. But how the hell one does that? Oh, we could talk about that. That'd be fun. Yeah, for sure. Because I think your article was very brave and uh, it did sit very deeply with a lot of people. I've spoken about that article to a lot of people. And I remember at the time thinking, I want to read this guy's book, <laughs> you know? So I think it did work in that way. And in particular, there was um, one section at the beginning of 32 Words for Field, where you explain where you're, not where your love of the Irish language came from, but almost where your sense of it came from, your understanding of it as, as almost like a creature. You talk about your granny um, and you ask her, what's the word for whole, you know? And she says, well, it depends. There's, if it's this way, if it's that way, if it's the other way. And it blew your mind that it was just, I think you said that um, it made me realize that it wasn't really just about the syntax. It was, I needed a different way of looking at the world for this language. And I suppose where what I'm what I'm wanting to know from you as a key Irish writer um, is what how do you see the the links between the Irish language and the land right now? So how do you think we can move forward? Obviously, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. You continuously talk in the book about place and how that we can know the place through the language. And I'm wondering, could you take that one step further? Do you feel there's a link between how we can relate to the actual land and those we share it with through the language? That's a beautiful question. And it's such a Karini doctorate question because that's, <laughs> that's exactly what you've come on this earth to do is almost make us see the land and our nature and environment in a different way. And it's what I am like, I am just chasing in your footsteps <laughs> coming to work out. But really, so whatever. Now we're in 2021. I think in 2016, I ran for the Green Party as a, for the general election as a Green Party member. And I was thinking, and I live in Westmead in the Midlands, and I was thinking, okay, uh, first, I don't want to go into government. I don't want to run for election. It was humiliating. But what, <laughs> anything, I sort of felt we do have a duty if we see a different way of living in the world to promote that and so I'm on you know I do a lot of radio tv newspapers and all but I thought the election is almost a perfect platform it is an actual like soapbox that you can talk about <laughs> and I realized what do I ultimately want to talk about and I remember actually a few years before that the Green Party had asked me before I'd ever thought of running they'd asked me to address their annual convention talking about the Irish language and I did and at the end, some of the um, candidates, the members of the party said, the delegates at the convention said, so what, what about the Irish language? You know, I've been talking, no, I've been talking about the, the ecology of uh, different ways of dealing with, uh, with the land. And then they asked about the language. And I said to them, like, if you're talking about the ecology and us growing sustainable foods and preserving the landscape so that we protect from, from climate change versus the language, the language can't compete. The language... Like I've written a book about the importance of language, but I'm aware also of the limitations of language. Like dance and music, or I would claim, are so much more profound than language. I'm not so sure you would agree with that. I don't think a poet would agree. But mm -hmm. but just let me continue my point. So 
I was saying, so I think land is more important, but language is a way of getting at, la at, land, mm. at, la at land, which is your question. Um, yeah. And why, what do I think? I think first, clearly our only chance at a future is to reconnect with the land. You know, since the last two generations, we came across a miracle way of living, of growing our own food, using industrial inputs and chemicals mm -hmm. and um, and using pesticides and herbicides to protect against. And it, it provided a miracle, like it provided the revolution, rev the green revolution. It grew so much more food for so many more people. And we just we didn't know that it wasn't going to be sustainable, that it was going to slowly mm -hmm. exhaust the soil, that it was going to profit just it was going to create the situation where some companies could control farming and the very nature of yeah. who gets to farm and who gets yeah. to produce food so none of that was obvious at the time the green revolution particularly in india looked like a miraculous thing we are now coming to we're coming to the beginning of the end of that farmers only in the last year two years few years are realizing okay that mass industrial farming <clears throat> means that only the industries profit and you ask any farmer no matter how much of yeah. an ifa stall what they are they realize that it is the creameries that are making the money it is the abattoirs it is the beef barons that are making them. they're not so we're coming and you know cap in europe has also come to that agreement too um slowly that the, the all those huge subsidies that are now go to the government that go to farming cannot go just as indirectly to the companies so we are going to come to new ways to get in touch with the land and that's going to be hard because any yeah. other time growing not in industrial way using mechanized transport is going to be really difficult and really profound and a, a man who's just invented who's just invested half a million or more in a creamery in a brand new creamery isn't going to hear this argument can't hear the argument that mm -hmm. this is coming will have to come to an end or at least be reimagined in such a way that uh, it's almost unimaginable so we all need different ways to to reconnect with our land and during you know the covid we have seen so many individuals mm -hmm. reconnecting with our land in beautiful ways walking swimming yeah. Just connecting to it um farmers are just beginning that journey realizing okay my old way it's not economically viable it's even even if i have qualms about its ethical and its moral viability definitely it's not economic so all of us are going to need to find a way and as we've seen also during the year of covid we're going to have to narrow our boundaries this idea of constantly thinking we can get our food um from peru or we can go on our holidays yeah. in Kenya will have to be rethought so as we come closer we're either going to be feel feel bereft are we are going to feel enriched by focusing yeah. on the um, on on the minutiae? And you have this beautiful piece in, in in your book in in thin places where you say if you ever have if you're a parent and you ever have a child who has been reared and brought up into the most traumatic experience imaginable, get them a microscope. Yeah. Make them focus on yeah. the world. It's basically a totally. meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It is. And I think really nicely you've brought yourself into my next question, um, which is that I know that just just slightly before COVID, um, you had already decided and you sort of made it public in your um, column in the Irish Times that you intended to stop or change how you travelled anyway. It was kind of this very, it must have been quite strange because you'd literally just decided that. And then um, and then we're I think we went into a two kilometre and then a five kilometre lockdown. And obviously in Ireland, we're still in a five kilometre lockdown. So I, I was interested in this idea of someone who is a travel writer who really, I think even if you write about language, you're writing about place, which is travel. How has your, how has that affected you when it's fine to make that choice, but when the choice is almost made for you, mm -hmm. how has it been? How has it been for you? traumatic really. <laughs> yeah. it has been like for everyone i suppose at the beginning that first lockdown you know was either traumatic for some people and blissful for others because other people realized okay now i have time to catch up all of that frantic running i've been doing for so long mm -hmm. and actually i don't want to travel i've been traveling for so long i want to calm down mm -hmm. but by now you know now february march it is just enervating and exhausting like I, I made that promise I was going to give up flying, not necessarily that I think the world needs to give up flying now, but I think me as a travel writer, travel yeah. journalist definitely had to, because I now know the harm it's doing. I could probably convince myself that a decade I didn't. So I knew that if in a decade to the future, knowing what I know now, I had still continued to proselytize and promote travel for another decade, I wouldn't be able to, to read, to sit on myself, but I was able to, um, 
re reassure myself with the concept that at least I would be able to take trains. And I had a whole year of wonderful train rides. I'd started last February in taking the train down to the Costa del Sol. And I had a whole year of trips. I was going to go to Bosnia. I was going to go down to the south of Italy. I was eventually, by the end of the year, going to get a train and a boat the whole way to Iceland. So all of that is uh, has gone. And I, I, had, I used to always say, oh, in another two months or three months, it'll be all be back. We don't know what's going on. No, we don't. But I do think what's really interesting is that it has changed so much for, for everybody. But creative people who are used to using travel or even just going to a coffee shop as a form of sort of escapism had to change how we, how we live our day-to-day -day life. And I suppose I view that as being really, really linked with the changes that, as you say, we do need to make. So I'm wondering... Um, how has your writing day, people are always interested in how writers write, how has your writing day shaped up now during the pandemic? Could you talk us through what, what fuels you, what inspires you? Do you have any rhythms or rituals or is it just haphazard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in many ways that the writing day hasn't changed so much, it's become honed, which is beautiful. So you know, uh, this book, 32 Words for, for Field, I have been writing on and off for over six years. And like any sort of writer in almost in the world, any sort of B or C or D level or E, e level writer, whichever mm -hmm. I am, you know, one is writing and one's juggling a million other things. One's writing yeah. articles or two doing radio or whatever other things one is doing. Yeah. And you're carving out a little bit of time. So yeah. uh, over six years, I would have written that book. And, what, uh, and now, since that book came out in September, and now it is, I have two other books to write. One, a book for children about uh, beautiful, wonderful, eccentric words in Irish for children. Wow. And then a big book about landscape and the insights that the landscape of Ireland can give also to our, to, into our heritage, our culture, our, our psyche and mm. into the other world. So I, the, I'm immersed in those. And so what I am doing is basically, it's basically the, it, the ideal I came up with when I was living in a cow shed in the Himalayas, what, 20 years ago, I, thought, I would love yeah. to, be able to get up in a simple haven, just a simple yeah. shelter of a house and surrounded by trees with a little stream, if I could, beside it, and just sit at a desk and write. And like, you know, my name is Monachon or Monachon in Irish, which probably means little monk, Monachon. Mm -hmm. And the last time Monachon was, existed was in the 6th century. He was, or no, he was in the 7th century. And he then was this hermit, and his, there's a little well of his, and a little oratory in Offaly, another one in Dingle. But then in the 12th century, poets started writing about him because they loved the romance of this isolated hermit um, sort of. <laughs> and when he talks, he says, he, he says, All I want is a little hut in the woods with salmon uh, in my stream outside, and leeks growing plentifully, and trees all around me, and 12 lithe young men to do my bidding. I think the 12, the 12 live young men was obviously a reference to the disciples. But otherwise, it was this, and I presume it was this monastic community. Mm. So I didn't know any about, anything about that until after India, I came back, bought my little house in Westmead, my 10 acres, I mean, and built my little house on it. And, uh, and then I realized that a stream, I started growing my vegetables and my leeks and I had my oak trees, my hazel. <laughs> so I kind of recreated his, his life. So in keeping that idea of recreating his life, which I'm certainly not doing consciously, but I find myself, I wake up every morning, I suppose, you know, uh, it depends. In summer, it'd be very early when the sun wakes me, but now it'd be 8 o'clock, 7.30. And then I light my stove and I put my soup, uh, my big soup casserole on top of my stove to slowly heat. Uh, and that's from the wood that I started growing 20 years ago. Wow. I mean, which was partly a idyllic dream, but maybe firewood might easily be outlawed within a few years' time on wood-burning stoves. So I don't know how long that can continue. You'd be carving it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I I sit there for about two hours and I write at the desk um, and then I have my lunch which is my soup and my tea and my cookies I bake my cookies on a Monday see it's absolutely a monastic life Brilliant. Then I normally now go for a swim this is because this I've never done this before since COVID but as you say so many of us are reconnecting to the yes. land and thank God because my book is benefiting because my book sort of helps yeah. with connection to the land um, so I go for my swim in, in Lock Lane, which is like two fields away. Um, and then, then I do another two hours writing. And then I go out into the land and either to, you know, dig up vegetables or to weed things or to build new areas or to check on the bees or to just do all, to feed the hens, to do all the work that is involved 
with this, like I'm under no illusions, if we are to move from industrial mechanized agriculture mm -hmm. to a more connected and simple way, there's a lot of work involved. Yeah, of people course. Be willing, yeah, to go back to that hardship, unless we do, we all do a little bit of it every day. Yeah, so it sounds like you do what many writers do, which is you do sort of around four hours a day and then a lot of the writing happens in the, the rhythmical doing of other things, baking bread or like Alice Oswald, you know, digging in the garden or whatever. So it sounds like that has been what your routine is anyway. And it's just got a bit more, as you say, honed. Um, I'm, I think this sort of slides in quite nicely, but I was really taken um, in your book with your portrayal of women. Um, and obviously with, with you talking about that we've all become a bit more at home, it's been a lot of discussion around like women are carrying a lot of the burden right now. A lot of my female writing friends who have children just really struggling. So I'm, I was very taken um, by how by how you spoke of women in the book, obviously it starts with your granny, then it moves the whole way through, you even look at sort of sexuality. Um, could you speak a bit about um, sort of women and Ireland in a general way? <laughs> I will. Um, I will. I'll say one final point about the last point before I talk about the women. One thing is that um, whenever we address people's writing lives, the one thing I should, I forgot to mention, I should, is the issue of fear and writing. And it's such a key issue. Now, I don't get, I don't have, I'm not as afraid of sitting down on the computer as I used to be, but I I'm still sometimes comes. And what's great is that if I come with a day where the self-doubt and the, the judgment comes in, I can shift over to journalism. And luckily, I don't get the fear. I used to get the fear of journalism, but that's less frightening. That's writing 400 words. It's like a school essay. It's an ordeal, yeah. but it's not frightening. But in being in front of a book, I wonder who am I kidding? Of course, I still get scared actually of a book, of the concept of a book. So yeah. I, whenever I teach writing classes, I always say like, allow the fear. Like what we're doing, writing is not natural. It is expanding more of one's soul, one of one's heart. And the very nature of one's pragmatic controlling brain has got us this far, has made us survive until today by not giving flight of fancy to those, to those more romantic imaginative sides. It keeps the train on the track. And the minute you mm -hmm. say, I am going to, re I'm going to imagine something from the cosmos and put it down the white paper, that should unsettle the, 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 the rational brain. And so the rational brain should kick in with fear and with anxieties. So we need to acknowledge it's there. And then we need to do whatever we found works um, to appease it. And yeah. Whether that is a full cafeteria of coffee, <laughs> or it is a long shower or a long walk or even a, 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 a tumbler of whiskey. Just do not be put, uh, put away by the, by mm -hmm. the Anyway, women. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I suppose in one way, you know, the book is looking at so many of the things we have lost. It's, it's, it's by nature a positive book because I tend to be rosy eyed. But at the same time, if one reads between the lines, I am saying all of these gorgeous, gorgeous, luscious, evocative words for different things. Um, and I'm celebrating them. But of course, the, the subtext is we are not saying these words anymore. Yeah. And I'm aware, too, that in terms of that law and that culture and that connection with the land, the biggest thing we have lost is the women's knowledge and the women's voice and the women's yeah. intuition. Because, like, compared to a lot of countries, we have managed, Ireland has managed, and, yeah, has managed to preserve so much of its Irish language culture. Uh, yeah. Like, poor old, you know, Westmeath has almost nothing yeah. from the old days our Wexford which is incredibly rich culture has yeah. nothing you had all of these folklorists because the early government because the likes of Evan de Valera and particularly Sheila de Valera his wife were so entranced with the romance of the Blasket Islands and the Aran Islands and the Donegal Highlands that all you know the from the very beginning that the folklore collectors were sent out those and there and then the great the great um Scandinavian and Northern European collectors and linguists and anthropologists went there too and collected but we have nothing from from other parts of Ireland but that said everything we do have so much of it is is in man's voice is the male perspective because it was yeah. entirely men collecting it. although they went to the likes of peg sayers and bob fertage they um it was for men so we have this huge no law of knowledge about landscape about history mm -hmm. about the pishroga about the super the proverbs but we don't what i yearn to find out about is the women's medicinal knowledge it's the mm -hmm. women's 
understanding of the moon cycles and how that worked on their mm-hmm. own bodies and how that worked with nature. Um, and although I see that in the, in the Irish language context, clearly that's relevant to everything you and I have been talking about so far. If we mm-hmm. need to reconnect with the land, then we need to connect with that way of working in harmony with cycles, with seasons, with yeah. terroir, as opposed to the male industrial way of having a big tractor. You know, the Maharajas mm-hmm. in India used to, used to parade with their elephants because their elephants were a symbol of their, their priapic, their, their sexual prowess. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and so we replaced the elephants with our other, sh- with our other show of might of our male force was the tractor. And we were able to yeah. control the female earth with that. Um, and so, you know, you see that with all the competitions, you see that with, with the IFA. It is a male dominated, a male concept industry producing our own food. And um, one could go any element, well, any part of the world is that. But we know that has got us into this far. In the same way, just like the Green Revolution, a male orientation was a miracle. All yeah. of what the, ma- the male drive has created in this world is miraculous. But we know if we're to survive, we're going to now need to kulu shir, to bring back and to show humility and to show connection to myriad different levels. And that's something yeah. that me as a man, I, can't, I don't do that very well. I, I still have this drive forward. You know, I choose, I do a yoga class and I choose the good looking yoga teacher. You know, the simplicity of the male mind just after the sexual, the sexual tick, positive, you know, the, the sort of, um, yeah. it's so... It's base. It's powerful, but it's base. And somehow humanity needs to move on to something. Different. But I think we're talking about it, which you're talking about it. And and obviously we have great female writers who are, who are talking about the role of the woman and Dern Griffith and how she's sort of um, reshaping how we view women's history and, and lots of people. So I think it's, I do think the land and femininity and language are very linked. And I, I picked up on that in your book. But so just um, in a minute, you're going to read for us. But I just have two more things I want to say, because I'm sure um, there are a million things that we could say. But I um, was taken by, in your book, um, you talk a lot about, it is a very positive book. I would definitely agree. It is a book about loss, but it is very positive. And um, you talk about absence. This is a part, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Dilather? Dilather? Dilather, yeah, Dilather. Yeah, and how that you discovered that this was not the absence really of, um, of anything in particular, but it was when something has been destroyed by us, by the human race. Um, and in a way that can seem quite like a, a negative or sort of a depressing thing. But then quite soon after in the book, you kind of you bring that hope back in that there are ways that we can reconnect with these words. I'm I'm keen to know, just to finish up, um, what has delivered hope to you through this very dark year? It's almost a year. What what do you think? Obviously, you've got your writing, you've got your land. Um, but what are the main things that have brought hope for you for our future, for our present? Yeah. So if I said, like, you remember when I ran for the Green Party in 2016, I was, re- re- I was trying to reimagine a world. And I thought, but the world I would see would require us almost to stop so much of what we're doing now. And people don't like stopping. We never would have liked to have our opportunities cur- curtailed. Um, and really what I saw is I don't want anyone to go back to some sort of hardship, definitely not the hardship of the past, the lack of opportunity, the lack of health, the lack of educational, um, um, yeah, just abilities and, mm-hmm. and opportunities, and particularly the harrowing work of labouring on the land all day. Yeah. But what I realised was if you go to any group of people who are trying to reimagine a place in the world, any community, they realise that it requires some thought work, some work on the head, but also nature work. Now, none of us had the time for that because we were commuting back and forth long hours to study, and then we were doing ever longer hours in cities. And because of the computer, we were expected to do all of that extra hours when we got home. Um, <clears throat> so there was less any time to do, to, 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 you know, to, to actually get out into nature and to realize, mm-hmm. actually, it's fun if one has some time to to play and to work do some work and to grow some vegetables and I couldn't imagine in my wildest dreams 
what would be the situations that would come make that come about? Yeah. That people would get to have the time because by being forced out of work, the, the government would pay them for having that extra time. And then they would think, well, we're not so sure the food is going to be here in the future. Let's grow our own food. And so within a matter of weeks, every seed, you know, catalog was sold out loud and people started growing. And they didn't find it a hardship. They found it a pleasure. They found it an enjoyment. They found it enriching. And then they realized our children weren't at school. They were stuck at home. So they would go out into the woods, out along the river walks, out into the, the coast, just to get the kids out of the house. And they realized how much, in, how enriching that was. So all, I am seeing so many positives. positives. Yeah. I am seeing this island is small. It's very easy to mm -hmm. reimagine it in a different way, in a way that everyone benefits, that people's psychological and emotional and soul minds are fulfilled, are warmed, are encouraged. And my problem was I couldn't see how to take step one. And yeah. COVID, this beautiful coronavirus, this variety virus of the kingdom, of the, of the crown, as well as creating so much sadness and so yeah. many appalling lonely deaths and lonely yeah. um, funerals has given the overall world the potential of an amazing, amazing re-beginning growth. So that is a very nice, hopeful um, point to end on. Um, before you do your reading, if that's okay, um, I just want to say a million thanks, uh, Gourmet and Maya, I'll get to the um, Limerick Literary Festival in honour of Kate O'Brien for hosting us. I also want to say a little thank you to my local parish of Street, who hosted me to do this Zoom call, because I'm at the, I'm in between three fields and a bog, and I didn't have enough, but um, thank you very much for uh, I'm pretty sure our audience will have loved listening to you. Um, I have anyway. So um, I'm just going to hand over to you now to finish off with a, with a little reading. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. And particularly, like, I'm going to, I have done a good few talks and I'm going to be doing a few talks, but I was looking forward to this chat, chance to talk to you, Kerry, more than oh, me too. And the beauty is we have so much more to talk about and we will have other opportunities yeah. to talk about. And particularly what I love about it is although, you know, as we hear from your voice, you are from... Derry uh, yeah. from yes right you are <laughs> yeah. Derry. And, um, but yet you have this the fact that you're in Street County West Mead beside the most gorgeous gorgeous Gareth Skill Bog yeah. and that I'm normally down in the other end of West Mead well still on the still on the east side of West Mead but further mm -hmm. south I just love doing a zoom call across West Mead from it's one great. <laughs> this is a, this book has come out in September uh, which is like whatever six, seven, eight months away ago. Yeah. This is only my second ever reading. No, wow. nobody asked me to read it because every bookshop is closed. So I'm. Excited. We need more. We need to hear it more. I'm just going to quickly show people before you go. It's absolutely stunning. It's a beautiful, beautiful cover. You should definitely buy this book. It's really great. Thank you, Carrie. Island Sanctuary is the piece I'm going to read, and uh, it's chapter. I don't know what chapter it is, but it's sort of in the first quarter of the book. And there's a. You see, there's a drawing of a club milk and uh, some cake, a uh, barn brack actually that is. And um, these, so Steve Dugan did the front cover and he also did these gorgeous, what are they called? Wood, wood, wood cut etchings, lino cuts inside. Anyway, Island Sanctuary. Handing on the language to her grandchildren was a key motivation for my grandmother, Sheila Humphreys, in later life. It was she who taught me furkmos, the unsteadiness of a stone about to fall, and blaman, the steam rising from a fermented haystack, which can also refer to the unsubstantial boasts of a braggart. She would take me through how the word biaka can mean the picking of a millstone, the act of explaining something, covering a paper with writing, or the dawn of a new day, braka and lane. Some people teach their offspring sports, life skills, ideals, or business prowess, but for Sheila, language represented something beyond all of these. She had seen how an immersion in Ireland's traditional language and customs had been the basis for her uncle's act of heroic self-sacrifice, or rush, rash folly, depending on one's, one's viewpoint. The O'Reilly's willingness to sacrifice everything to free his compatriots from enslavement to England arose from his mounting realization of the truth of the statement made by a leading rebel of the preceding generation, Thomas da Davis, who wrote that a people without a language of its own is only half a nation. A nation should guard its language more than its territories. It is a surer barrier and more important frontier than fortress or rivers. 
In her early teens, Sheila took on that belief and it was copper fastened on that Easter, on that Monday morning of Easter week in 1916. Ever since that moment, she devoured, she devoted her life to fulfilling the O'Rahilly's vision of an independent Irish speaking nation. So that was obviously the O'Rahilly, her uncle had went out to 1916 and then died. This first took the form of fighting England, stealing bullets, hiding guns, carrying secret dispatches for rebel leaders, tending to them when they were injured or in guerrilla skirmishes, and training other women to join the fight. In time, Sheila became the vice president of Common Amal, the women's auxiliary army that supported the Irish Republican army in every way it could. This became the focus of her life for the next 20 years, until her mother and her aunt, the O'Reilly's sisters, convinced her to give up fighting and find a man to have a family with, a risk be disinherited by them. She capitulated, principally because the money she would inherit would be used to further the cause. By that time, she had spent three years in prison at different times and endured 31 days on hunger strike with countless more rough nights spent on the run, hiding from her enemies. The next phase of Sheila's life would have to be more sedate, for the sake of her only surviving child, my mother. But she redoubled her efforts towards promoting the Irish language. My mother's first language was Irish and Sheila ensured that it would also be ours when we came along 30 years later. Despite our living in Dublin, she made sure that we didn't get to experience any English until we were four or five. Our minders and babysitters were Irish speakers. Our first books and games were in Irish and television was strictly limited. Once we were old enough to encounter the wider world, she bribed us with sweets and money to learn new Irish words and phrases. And she would learn, and she would read us passages of local County Kerry folklore and memories mixed with accounts of Republican propaganda. If, and only if, the Irish was suitably eloquent in them. My favourite thing was when she'd share stories of her childhood holidays with the O'Reilly and his extended family on the Dingle Peninsula from 1912 onwards. For the first few years, they would go out to stay on the Great Blasket Island, on the very tip of West County Kerry. The entire family, Sheila and her mother, brothers and aunt, alongside the O'Reilly, his wife and four children, would move into the tiny thatched cottage of Cart Nigahin, the daughter of the King of the Island, an elected community leader that was common in the social structure of some of the islands off the West Coast or other neighbouring houses, depending on who had spare, a spare patch of, of floor space. Through these stories, I got to know everyone on the island, including the last king, Padre Cucahal, the great Shanachi, custodian of tradition and storytelling. Peg Sayers, too, and the author of the classic memoir of Tolanach, the island man, Tomás O'Chihin. I knew who on the island was a right mandlum, a thick-set boorish person, and who had the sweetest mandlum dud, a morning croon while preparing breakfast, and who could carry the largest mandlum bug, which is an untidy armful of hay. I knew who was the best igmargiacht, bargaining, with passing sailors, and who was more adept at the rakaracht, which describes bargaining accompanied by impassioned exclamations and non-verbal negotiations. Something that was necessary when dealing with the German, English and Russian mariners who occasionally holed up during the First World War. At its most expansive, Rackerucht can imply that the goods are worth far more than the price being offered. And that, in fact, the seller is making a sacrifice by offering them at this knockdown rate. I often felt that there was a degree of Rackerucht to my great granduncle's martyrdom. On the Great Blasket, Sheila experienced a life that was unchanged for centuries, scaling cliffs to gather the eggs of nesting marine birds, butchering, butchering seals for lamp oil, grabbing puffins from the air, salvaging flotsam from sunken vessels, all the while being immersed in one of the purest sources of Irish that still existed. It was a form of the language that, retrain, that retained traces of its roots in the Indus Valley in Central Asia. You could hear echoes in their dialect of words and phrases that had veered off from Sanskrit, Persian and Hebrew millennia before. Now that last sentence is quite a grand claim and how I explain it, you'll have to read uh, the rest of 32 words for field. Oh. <laughs> Go me my, my, my. <laughs> uh, 